The Battle of Rourke's Drift was a battle in the Anglo-Zulu War. Rourke's Drift today is far different to what it was like in 1879. Of the soldiers who survived the battle, three of them are buried in Swansea cemeteries. The defence of the mission station of Rourke's Drift was under the command of Lieutenants John Chard of the Royal Engineers and Gonville Bromhead. He came after the British Army's defeat at the Battle of Isandwala on the 22nd of January 1879. A little over 150 British and colonial troops successfully defended the garrison against an intense assault by three to four thousand Zulu warriors. The Zulu attack on Rourke's Drift came very close to defeating the small garrison, but were eventually repelled. Eleven Victoria Crosses and five Distinguished Conduct Medals were awarded to the defenders. Rourke's Drift, known as Kwa Jimu, Jim's Land in the Zulu language, was a mission station and the former trading post of James Rourke, an Irish merchant. It was located near a drift or ford on the Buffalo Muziathi River, which at the time formed the border between the British colony of Natal and the Zulu Kingdom. On the 9th of January 1879, the British No. 3 Centre Column under Lord Chelmsford arrived and encamped at the drift. On the 11th of January, the day after the British ultimatum to the Zulus expired, the column crossed the river and encamped on the Zulu bank. A small force consisting of B Company, 2nd Battalion, the 24th of Foot, the 2nd Warwickshire Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, was detailed to garrison the post, which had been turned into a supply depot and hospital under the overall command of Brevet Major Henry Spaulding, 104th Foot, a member of Lord Chelmsford's staff. I sit here awaiting the arrival of Lord Chelmsford's column to return. News is they are on their way and should be with us any time soon. I'm very tired. I have not been able to find any time to sleep since the Zulu started to the attack on us yesterday. We're all exhausted and thirsty. Water was rationed. We ran out late yesterday, the last of it being given to the wounded in the storeroom, which is being used as a makeshift hospital. It seems so long ago now, but it was only three days ago my company were told to remain at Rourke's Drift and to guard their stores and the hospital which had just been established itself here. The rest of the column, including the battalion, continued over the Buffalo River and into Zululand. They are going to advance to Islamwana Hill, only 10 miles east of our position. At this time, we are under the command of Lieutenant Bromhead. Then, earlier yesterday, Colour Sergeant Bourne informed us all that another officer had returned from the column at Islamwana to fix a pontoon bridge across the river. Lieutenant John Chard, his name is. Royal Engineers, I believe. At around 3 p.m. I was helping to remove stores from one of the buildings to the hospital when I was told of terrible news. Terrible news. The column, including the rest of our battalion and the first 24th, had been massacred by thousands of Zulus at Islamwana. I could not believe what we had been told. It was impossible to believe. It was then that the lads were told that we had a new officer commanding in the form of Lieutenant Chard, with Lieutenant Bromhead, his second in command. News then hit us that the Zulus were making their way directly for us and they would not be long to reach us. At that time, I was aware that we are only 70 strong, led by Lieutenant Bromhead. Also 100 men from the Natal native contingent and some lads from the 1st 24th and a commissariat. There's not many of us to stand against the thousands of Zulus. I was very frightened. I had never been in battle before. The palms of my hands were getting sweaty and I initially could not stop shaking. Our post consisted of two stone buildings about 40 yards apart, with one being used as a storehouse and the other as a hospital. The order was bellowed by Colour Sergeant Bourne for us to immediately set work to a loophole and barricade the buildings and build makeshift defences, using the mealy bags from the stores to make walls connecting the two buildings. At 4.30pm, I saw my first Zulu appear to the southeast. They were all stood on a hill overlooking our post. What a sight. I was scared, but in awe at the same time. The Zulu were all chanting, which echoed around the valley. It was this point I noticed that when the Zulu appeared, the Natal native contingent, they bolted. They just ran. There was nothing we could do to stop them. I held on to one of them to stop him jumping over the mealy bags. But he just wriggled so much he got away. 
This left about 140 of us in total, whom 36 were patients in the hospital itself. On completing the barricade, the order came to stand to. I was stood near the hospital. I held my martini Henry and I placed a round in the chamber ready. The first Zulu party looked to be headed by a chief on a white horse. They halted for a moment and then advanced towards us at the run. It appeared they were expecting to surprise us. At 500 yards, we opened fire with telling effect. The smoke from the fire was thick around us and the sound of gunfire was deafening. Numbers dropped in front of us, but the Zulu pressed on towards us. Taking full advantage of the broken ground, they then appeared to establish themselves in the garden and some uncleared bush near the buildings. Suddenly, we came under fire ourselves. The shots were coming from a ridge behind us. They must have got them from the lads at Islamana. They maintained heavy, but fortunately for us, inaccurate fire. Keep your heads down, was the shout that echoed around the post. Then we were rushed again by the Zulu. The majority were armed with stabbing assegais as they ran at us, and they were chanting loudly. This alone unnerved me. I managed to keep my head down from the fire directed towards us. The order was again given, fire! I fired so many times that my barrel was getting very hot. Despite the odds of 40 to 1, we all shot steadily and effectively. Time and time again, the Zulu ran at us and swarmed the barricades. Their courage was extraordinary and they cared for nothing of their losses as they tried to get over the barricades and into the end room of the hospital building. Many times, Lieutenant Bromhead collected a few of the lads, which included myself. We had to drive them off with a bayonet charge. As I charged them with my bayonet fixed, some of the Zulu tried seizing our rifles and tried to pull the bayonets off. Due to the position, no flanking fire was possible along any of our defences, as in case to cause our own injuries. Only due to our tremendous exertions were the Zulu kept at bay. This was especially the case with the fire that was still coming from the hill at the rear. Although inaccurate, it did cause some casualties amongst us. At 6pm, the Zulus did finally succeed in setting fire to the thatched roof of the hospital. This was clearly making the building undefendable. The problem then arose on how to keep off the Zulu, while the sick, many of whom were too ill to walk, were evacuated to the safety of the storehouse. I was seeing some gallant deeds then that day. But for the courage of the half dozen privates of the 2nd 24th, who formed the garrison within the doomed building, a lot of the wounded would have been lost to the Zulu. We fell back from room to room. We fought fiercely with bullet and bayonet to help cover the escape of the sick. I can say with thank goodness, nearly all of whom reached safety. I saw Private Hook walk out of the burning building with Private Connolly being carried on his back. The building was starting to fall inwards as they cleared it. On the evacuation of the hospital completed, we were able to concentrate our defence around the storehouse. There we had an inner link of defence. This had been built out of biscuit boxes. The Zulu tasks continued. Again and again they rushed us, and each time we repulsed them. The smoke from our martini henrys making visibility difficult, and the stench of death was all around us. Nightfall came quickly, but the attacks continued. We were helped very much by the light coming from the burning hospital. As the night wore on, the Zulu attacks appeared to lose their sting, with only the odd attack being fought back. As dawn broke, the attack stopped. The Zulu appeared to have left. I could see the bodies of hundreds of dead Zulu in and around the barricades, with many more on the broken ground outside. It's been a few hours now, and no sign of the Zulu. Some of the lads, who had been sent out, have just returned, confirming they've gone. I can't believe it. It's now 8am, and information has been spread around the post. Lord Chelmsford's column are appearing over the hill. Just been told, I need to now go and line up on parade for roll call. Three of the men who fought at Rook's Drift are buried in Swansea. They are 963 Private David Lewis, James Owen of B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment. 
841 Private David Jenkins, 1st Battalion, 24th Regiment. 906 Private John Connolly, C Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment. All survived the battle. Private David Lewis was born in Swansea and worked as a tin worker. His name was James Owen, but used the alias David Lewis on joining the British Army. It was not unusual for men to give false names when joining the army. He was posted to 2nd Battalion, the 24th Foot, in 1877. In 1879, when he left the army, an injury assessment board held at the Royal Hospital Chelsea confirmed he was suffering from valvular disease of the heart due to being under canvas for months and constantly exposed to climatic vivicitudes. Whilst in the army, he was known to read letters from home to the men who could not read themselves and to write their replies in what was described as his beautiful handwriting. He died in Swansea aged 87 in 1938 while living with his son in Campbell Street, Bryn Mill. His grave is in Bethel Cemetery in the city's Sketty area. Private David Jenkins was born in Devonog near Brecon in 1846 and enlisted for the town's 25th Brigade at the age of 28, being posted to South Africa in 1874. From 1882, he served with the South Wales Borderers, becoming Lance Corporal the following year. He was responsible for saving the life of Lieutenant John Chard, the commanding officer at Rourke's Drift, by ducking his head down to miss a bullet. Private Jenkins had not been on the original role as having served at Rourke's Drift, but his family found evidence to say he was there and his name was then included. He was discharged in 1888 and settled in Swansea, where he became a storekeeper in the city's docks. On a royal visit to Swansea in 1904, he was introduced to King Edward VII. David Jenkins died in 1912 and is buried in Cumgetley Cemetery, Treborth, Swansea. Last but by no means least is Private John Connolly, born in Castletown, Bearhaven, County Cork, Ireland in 1859. His final resting place is an unmarked pauper's grave at Danagraig Cemetery, Swansea, Section A, Grave 458. Private John Connolly was a patient in the hospital at Rourke's Drift when the battle started, recovering from a dislocated knee caused when he slipped, loading a wagon at Tugela River. The accident left him hanging downwards between the outside rails, thus dislocating his knee. Private Hook VC was guarding the hospital and rescued Connolly by dragging him behind him, escaping through a hole made in the hospital wall and then carrying him on his back to safety. Unfortunately for Private Connolly, his knee was again dislocated in the process. Private Hook said, Watching my chance, I dashed from the doorway, and grabbing Connolly, I pulled him after me through the hole. His leg got broken again, but there was no help for it. As soon as we left the room, the Zulus were in there with furious cries of disappointment and rage. Now there was a repetition of the work. Again I had to drag Connolly through, a terrible task, because he was a very heavy man. Alphonse de Neuville's painting of the battle, based on eyewitness accounts, depicts several events occurring at once, including Private Henry Hook VC carrying Private John Connolly on his back away from the burning hospital. When John Connolly left the army, he moved to Swansea and married Kathleen Crowley at Swansea, September 1885. The 1901 census for Swansea shows him living with his wife, Catherine Connolly, knee Crowley, their four children all living at 35 Llangevelach Street, Swansea. A 1906 newspaper reporting on the death of John Connolly said, Poor Connolly was invalided home with a broken knee, and death has only now released him from almost constant suffering since that time. Rheumatic fever set in, complications ensued, and dropsy ended him. When our reporter visited him, he found the sufferer full of his old-time grit. The sunlight streamed through the little window across the bed on which he lay. John Connolly said in humorous sadness, If the world frowns on me, the sun shines. Private John Connolly was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave, but with full military honours at 3pm on Saturday the 10th of November 1906. His grave at Danagraig Cemetery is today still unmarked. Like his fellow soldiers, Private Connolly defended Rorkstrift with great courage and should not be forgotten.